Pastor Dan here. Welcome to Sundays at Home. Thanks for tuning in today. Uh, just uh, hope everybody's doing all right and want to just share a few thoughts with you today as we continue our core value series and exploring what it is that makes Life Tree what we are and who we are and what makes us us. Um, for those who don't know, my parents, uh, when I was in college, decided to get out of Dodge and uh, they moved out of the country and headed to Costa Rica and then uh, eventually onto Mexico. And they lived there for about a decade. Um, and during that time, they experienced something uh, that perhaps some of you have experienced called culture shock. And culture shock is when you're in a new environment, in a new atmosphere, and uh, as you're experiencing life there and living there, you begin to notice things that are just different than what you've experienced growing up, what you're used to, the culture that you're used to, and it's disorienting, it's a little different. And I've heard a lot of people talk about this time, about this stay-at-home order as being a very, very, very similar, very much like culture shock, uh, uh, disorienting. We're adapting to a new world. There's new norms about how we travel, about what we do for work, about how we eat. Everything's just changed. And it's almost like a brand new culture. And uh, one of the things that happens with culture shock is in the beginning, as you're still orienting, there's part of it that's kind of fun. You're figuring it out and you're, you're learning and you, you kind of like it. And then at a certain point, the, uh, the honeymoon is over and you hit a place where you go, all right, I've had enough. Uh, I'm done with this. Why can't I buy toilet paper? Where's the toilet paper? Where are they keeping it? Why can't I buy, why can't I just go sit down at a restaurant? Why can't I just go out? And we, we get sort of that, I think at that point, maybe in the last week or two, we're starting to see that shine wear off of just this is this not fun anymore. Um, not that it was ever intended to be fun, but just you understand that that, that, that new culture that we're adapting to, we kind of hit that wall and adapted to something new. We're getting tired of it, and, uh, and I'm feeling it. I don't know if you're feeling it, but I'm feeling I'm feeling, okay, I'm, I'm tired of this. It's gotten long, and not to say that we should be reckless in any way or endanger anybody, but just feeling that. You're feeling that, that change, uh, and it's a battle. It's a grind. It's a grind to continue to stay sharp, to stay mentally focused, to continue to keep our habits going, to keep ourselves healthy. And I think that same battle that we're fighting physically, externally, we're fighting internally. It's the same exact war going on inside of us uh, for our hearts and all that stuff. In Galatians chapter 6, verse 9, we, we, we read this. It says, So let's not get tired of doing what is good. At just the right time, we'll reap a harvest of blessing if we don't give up. I just want to ask the question, why did, why did Paul have to say that? You know, Paul shared that. Why did he have to tell people not to get tired of doing good? Very simply, I think it's because we get tired of doing good. We get tired, we grow weary in that. There are days I just don't feel like being nice. There are days I don't feel like being forgiving or gracious or merciful or patient with anybody else. And I'll say things like, well, my filter's gone today. Or just ignore me today because I can tell that I've gotten tired of doing good. And I'm just letting it rip, and I'm, it doesn't matter, and I don't really care. Um, and what we're saying really is just, I'm tired of doing what's right. I don't know if you've ever felt that, but I know I go through that, and I feel that. Uh, and as long as this home directive continues, um, and as long as it's been, you know, our commitment to Jesus is for life. It's not just a couple of months, and then we're out of this. Like This is something that we say we're in for life. I want to follow Jesus for life. And so... I'm trying to do what's right for the rest of my life. And Paul's saying here, don't get tired of doing what's, of what's, doing what's good and right because it's, you're in for the long haul. And it, it gets tested because the shine of following Jesus, it wears off. You hit that honeymoon period and you're like, oh, this is great, following Jesus is great. And then all of a sudden you realize, yeah, that means I gotta forgive people. I don't feel like forgiving. I gotta be kind when I don't feel like being kind. And I gotta be patient when my patience is shot. You know, we start going and you realize it gets hard to be patient and loving and hopeful and faith-filled and you just you get tired of it. You just grow weary. Um, and that's why it's so important to listen to the promise. That's the second half of that verse that Paul shared. He said, listen, if, you'll, if you won't quit, if you'll keep going, you'll reap a harvest of blessing if you don't give up. Life has seasons. This is one of them. This is absolutely one of them and there will be more. In some seasons you plant, in some seasons you water and you tend, in some seasons you harvest, and in some seasons you give the land rest, and you hope that it's gonna come back. All of it is a faith-filled endeavor. Every time you plant a seed in the ground, in the dirt, it's hope 
in hope that that seed is going to turn into something and grow, and hope in hope of the harvest. Every day you spend pulling weeds, uh, watering, fertilizing, it's, it's hope that the harvest is coming. You're, you're not wasting time. You're hoping that that harvest is coming. And every time, every winter that there's a season of rest, you, you're enduring that with the hope that that land is renewing and restoring itself so that it can come back and be ready for harvest again, that it can continue to be productive and produce. But until we see that harvest, it's all just a hope. It's all just faith. It's just constant faith and a trust journey. Um, and Paul is pleading with you, listen, just don't quit, right? If until you see that harvest, it's coming, don't quit. Just keep going. Don't grow weary in doing good. And we've been exploring our core values, like we said, and, and this next value totally depends on hope. It's founded on hope. If hope isn't there, this value falls apart. And it's a very, very tree-ish value for those who, uh, who know life tree stuff. So I'm going to read Matthew chapter 7, verse 15 first, and then we'll present the value. And it reads this. It's uh, Jesus talking. He says, Beware of the false prophets who come disguised as harmless sheep, but are really vicious wolves. You can identify them by their fruit, that is, by the way they act. Can you pick grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? A good tree produces good fruit. I sound like a kindergarten teacher. And a bad tree produces bad fruit. A good tree can't produce bad fruit. And a bad tree can't produce good fruit. So every tree that does not produce good fruit is chopped down and thrown into the fire. Yes, just as you can identify a tree by its fruit, so you can identify people by their actions. Really, right off the bat, here we go. First things first, trees are terrible liars. They just can't fake it, right? Apple trees grow on apples. Grapes go, grow on vines. Uh, fig trees grow, or supposedly grow on trees. I don't know, I'm not sure I buy that. I got a fig tree and I'm still waiting to see figs. But you don't see oranges on apple trees. You know, if, if an orange is growing on it, that's an orange tree, right? If a peach is growing on it, that's a peach tree. Trees are terrible liars. They just can't do it. Um, and what Jesus, Jesus is telling us here is that fruit is a trustworthy and reliable indicator of identity. You want to know what that tree is? Look at the fruit. You, you, it's not going to, it can't lie. So you want to know what kind of tree it is? Look at the fruit. The fruit reveals the kind of tree that it is. And basically, Jesus makes the distinction or the equation that people are just like trees. Absolutely just like trees. That people can't lie. Right? What comes out of us it reveals what we are. We are what our fruit says we are. Right? So if I say, it doesn't matter what I say, it matters what we do. Right? That's what reveals it. And so that's our core value that we're, gonna, that we're sharing today is that this, what we do matters. The fruit that we put out in our life, it matters, right? Our fruit matters. And so what's the fruit that comes out of our lives? I mean, I'm not, you know, we just had some uh, cotton candy grapes, some weird stuff. I'm not sure if I believe that's not genetically modified in some way. It's a little strange, but um, our fruit, we don't, I don't put fruit out. So what fruit is coming from my life? Well, very clearly it's, it's patience, it's love, it's joy, it's peace, it's goodness, right? The fruit of the spirit, all, all that kind of stuff. What's coming out of you? It's all your words, all your thoughts, all your actions, all your intentions, your effort, what comes out of you? What's the product of your life? That's your fruit. And you are defined by your fruit. You're identified, you're recognized by your fruit. Not what you say, but by what you do. It defines us. It's a great line, famous movie. If you've seen it, Batman Begins. Um, it's a scene where Bruce Wayne, who's Batman's uh, secret, you know, unknown public figure, He's acting poorly, he's acting like an idiot really, and he runs into an old friend, an old, uh, a friend and uh, a neighbor of his, and, and she says, what are you doing? And he just says, oh, this, this isn't me. And she makes this statement, she says, it's not, it may not be who you say you are, but the truth is, it's what you do that defines you. It's like, oh man, what a, just a, what a powerful, brutal saying right there. I mean, she just nails him to the floor. What we do matters talks cheap. What comes out of you? That's really what it is. Everything you do matters. Um, there was a restaurant, I won't say which one, in our area that I used to go to and uh, when, when restaurants were open. Um, and I liked their food most of the time. Some days, though, you'd go and I'd order the same thing I'd gotten in the past, and it was terrible. I mean, some days I'd get in like, man, this is great. And other days I'd get the same exact thing, but like, oh, and come to find out that they got different chefs in the back and depends on who's cooking that day. And you know what? That matters. Um, it's not like mostly they're good, 
because then anytime I think about bringing a guest somewhere and I think about that place, I go, eh, I don't know if I want to risk it because I'm not sure. I don't have confidence that they're going to put out something good because, listen, they can make it great 90% of the time, but 10% of the time, if it's not good, that gives me pause. And that's the thing. Talk is cheap, right? The best sermon, the best example, the best leadership, any of that is what you do. That's what people are watching. You teach, you teach what you know, but you reproduce what you are. People are watching, my kids are watching, your kids are watching, your neighbors, your friends, your family, your coworkers, your classmates, your teammates, everybody's watching, they're watching. And so what you do matters. The fruit that comes out of your life matters. But there's another piece to this, another side to this. We find this, again, Paul says this in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, and verses 58. He says this, so my dear brothers and sisters, be strong and immovable. Always work enthusiastically for the Lord, for you know that nothing you do for the Lord is ever useless. Why do we get tired of doing good and stop trying? Why do we give up sometimes? Why would, why would anybody get tired of doing good? I think it's not just the length of it. Sometimes we start to wonder, is this making any difference? Is this doing any good? I've been doing this over and over and over again. I've been praying for so long and it's just not making a difference. I've been, I've been reading my Bible and it's not making a difference. I've been trying to do this, the branches groups, it's not making a difference. Um, and so many times we just sit there and go, man, this is just useless. And we give up because we think it doesn't matter anymore. We, we give up, that motivation makes a huge difference in our life. So much of our life is tied to motivation. If we, if we believe in the power of something, we're gonna do it. And if we're not motivated, we're not gonna do it. Many of you right now, as you're watching this, wherever you're watching it, you're probably in comfortable clothes. Uh, there might even be some sweatpants uh, out there in, in, as, you're, as you're watching this. And you know, you, know, you know what they say about sweatpants. George Costanza on Seinfeld, right, walked in wearing sweatpants and, and Jerry said, you know what sweatpants means, right? Sweatpants says, I've given up. I quit. I quit. I quit trying. It doesn't matter. Sweat, sweatpants is waving the white flag. Maybe you're wearing sweatpants because it doesn't matter. Nobody's going to see you. If we were to do this in person, you probably wouldn't be wearing what you're wearing right now. And that's really what it comes down to. Motivation. Right? When, we, when we feel like it matters, we change our behavior. And sometimes we stop doing good because we think it doesn't matter anymore. Um, and I just want to say what, what, what Paul is revealing for us here is, listen, everything you do, nothing's useless. Everything you do for the Lord it's, it's, it's going to count. It's all going to matter. Listen, it's not so much that your effort makes it count, but God takes your effort and he makes that count. What you do, your effort matters because God takes what you do and he makes it count. You can't work hard enough to make what you do count. But when you do it in service to the Lord, when you do it in, in relationship with God, he takes what you do, all that effort, and he makes it count. So to summarize, really just make this pretty brief today. So to summarize, trees are terrible liars. <laughs> Fruit is a great indicator of the identity of trees. People are just like trees. We're terrible liars as well, right? Uh, we're identified by our, by our fruit in, in, just as trees are. What we do matters. It's significant. And the reality is we get tired of doing what's good. We get tired of doing what's good. Even when we know, even when we know that this counts, we can still get tired of doing what's good. So the question really for us today is this, how do we keep going? How do we keep fighting the good fight? How do we not give up? How do we not quit? And it really comes down to this, there's one word, really one word, one action step, it's just one thing that I'm gonna share with you today um, that I think guarantees constant fruitfulness in our lives. You might be sitting there saying, Pastor Dan, come on, seriously, one thing I can do that's gonna guarantee, I don't even think a fruitful life can be constant. Can anybody have a constantly fruitful life? And I'm gonna say absolutely. And it's not my idea, because so that's, that's why I'm confident in this. It's not my idea. We're gonna read it straight from the mouth of Jesus. So we're gonna read from John chapter 15, and this is what Jesus says about how to stay constantly fruitful, how to make sure that what you do matters for the right reasons. What we do always matters, it always will. Good or bad, what we do matters, it's always going to identify us. So how do we ensure that what we do matters for good? Jesus tells us the secret to that. Here we go, John chapter 15. He says, I am the true grapevine, and my Father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch of mine that doesn't produce fruit, and he prunes the branches that do bear fruit so they will produce even more. You have already been pruned and purified by the message I have given you. So here it comes, remain in me, and I will remain in you. For a branch cannot produce fruit if it is severed from the vine, 
and you cannot be fruitful unless you remain in me. Yes, I am the vine, and you are the branches. Those who remain in me, and I in them, will produce much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. Anyone who does not remain in me is thrown away like a useless branch and withers. Such branches are gathered into a pile to be burned. But if you remain in me and my words remain in you, you may ask for anything you want and it will be granted. When you produce much fruit, you are my true disciples. This brings great glory to my Father. The key to making sure that, we, that what we do matters for good is remaining in Jesus. Remaining in Jesus. Now that's a kind of a, a strange word. It's, a, it's an odd phrase. What does it mean to remain in somebody? And what, so I'm just going to break that down really quickly. A couple of things. One, it means to remain in relationship with him. Remain in relationship with God. That's what it really means. It means to maintain that contact, maintain that conversation, maintain that connection between you and God. And there's really a couple ways that you can do that. First, remain in his word. He says, he says, my words remain in you. If you're in the word of God daily, if you're reading, listen, daily Bible reading is not just something, I'm not selling Bibles. I get no money from any Bible sales anywhere. There's no personal benefit to me uh, financially or any other ulterior motive like that. I, I truly telling you, listen, you don't have to read the Bible. We get to read the Bible. And when we read the Bible, the Bible reads us. When the word of God is in us, we're remaining. If that word remains in us. What we read, it sticks with us. It stays with us. Reading the Bible is not just some religious habit. It's absolutely critical to maintaining that relationship with God because as we do it, his word begins to remain in us and fruit comes out because that the word reads us. It corrects bad attitudes. It, it gives us wisdom about the decisions. It tells us how we're supposed to spend our day. So as you remain in God, in his word, as you daily, listen, daily Bible reading, very simply, if you're not reading the Bible daily, start you should absolutely start today. That's step number one to remaining in relationship with God is reading the Bible every day. It's a commitment. It's a choice. It's work. It can, we can grow weary in doing it. Don't stop. It produces fruit. It absolutely changes your heart. It's like a constant update. It updates your every single day. It's a system upgrade for your entire soul. Read the word of God every day. So let me ask you, it's like food, right? Like the daily bread, that daily, like we consume it. Let me ask you, are his words in you? You want to know how to remain in Jesus? Remain in his word. Second, remain on your knees. It says very clear, it says, if you remain in me, you can ask whatever you want and you will have it. See, because when you remain in God, when you're remaining in relationship with God, what happens is you start to gain his heart. As you get to know God, his heart starts to align with your heart and it starts to beat on the same exact tempo and rhythm for the same things, about the same things. And so then you know how to pray because you're praying what God wants. So the more that you keep praying every day as you, as you do that, you're staying in relationship with God and you're going to begin to see your prayers answered. So let me just ask you really quickly, is, is there power in your prayer? If you don't feel like there's power in your prayer, perhaps, just perhaps, you're not remaining in relationship with God enough to get those heart, to get his heart on things. Let that align. Because he says, listen, you can ask whatever you want and I'm going to do it when you remain in me. Remain in relationship with God. And the last thing, very simply, is to remain in fellowship with God. Remain in fellowship. And fellowship, again, highest form of relationship with God, with each other. But as we continue to stay in relationship with each other, there's something, it's not just about the church and it's 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 not just uh you know, our gatherings obviously because we've talked about that before but the church is the body of christ so you want to remain in god remain in the body remain connected you can't be disassociated from the rest of the body and remain in christ you cannot do it independent of his body you cannot stay in christ and not have the church not have people so many people right now are saying, listen, I'm so good with God, but I want nothing to do with the church. And I'm telling you, it's impossible. Not possible. Can't do it. You want to remain in Jesus, you have to remain in relationship with his body, which is other people. That's how he has designed it. God has absolutely sunk himself into people. And that's where we find him, is in relationship. So listen, Zoom calls, phone calls, texts, whatever you got to do. Just go visit somebody on their porch. Call, you know, drive, drive and six feet away. Do whatever you have to do. Stay in relationship with people. 
But as you're in relationship, listen, remain in the word, remain on your knees, and remain in relationship with people. And when we do that, we remain in relationship with God, and he's at work in our life. And I just want to say, listen, when we do that, he says, listen, if you're separated from the body, if you're separated from God, if you're separated from the source, you wither, you dry up. It, there's nothing good anymore. It's, it's so, it, it's, we lose our life. But when we remain in him, healthy, growing, full of love, vibrant, that's what it means. Don't grow weary in doing good. Keep going, and you can keep going as you remain. That's it, one word, one word for this week, remain. Remain, that's all you gotta do. And here's the best part, it says, when we remain, when we become fruitful, it says that God is glorified. What that really means is that we shine a spotlight on him. It's like a star on a stage. We put that spotlight big on God and people get to meet the gardener. Because there's people all over the world who are meant to be grafted in to this vine, grafted into the source of life. And when we exhibit fruit, when you, when you are loving, when you are kind, when you are patient and gracious, people notice. Because that fruit looks different than the fruit they're seeing anywhere else. And when they notice that, when they see that, it just shines a spotlight on Jesus. And people are drawn to it. And they get to meet the gardener who can change their life. I'm telling you this week, church, what you do matters. Absolutely matters. So I encourage you with that. We love you. Let me pray for you today. Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for this great, great opportunity we have to represent you. Lord, bear fruit in our lives. Help us to be fruitful people. Lord, work in us in such a way that what comes out of us leads other people to you. It's in your wonderful name we pray, Lord. Amen. God bless your church. Love you. Can't wait to see you soon.